When you are born in Las Vegas, it's hard to resist a punt. And tennis great Andre Agassi is every bit a Las Vegan. As Toy Guest Sports Editor, he predicted that Novak Djokovic will surpass Roger Federer's slam tally of 20. In India to support an inclusive literacy product, Agassi opened up on a range of topics. Excerpts What about education excites you and do tennis players miss out on it? I don't know any sport where you can be the best in the world and not give up a third of your life to not prepare for two-thirds of your life. So as a result, this is by definition, a very difficult road to choose, but because I know what it's like not to have an education I also know what it's like not to have a choice because I was forced to play tennis. So when I take no education and no choice in some of the toughest, economically challenged places in the world, it's really sobering what that means for their life. And this is how it feels when you're pushing your mission that has been so personally inspiring even to my own success because it was because of this that I stayed in tennis when I could have quit. It gave me my second chance. It gave me many more titles, gave me my wife, my children, my platform. What is it about Square Panda that made you come on board and what does it mean? It's been a long journey in education. It started with my foundational school in Las Vegas Charter School in the poorest neighborhood that led to me figuring out ways to scale my mission through the private sector throughout America, managing a billion-dollar real estate infrastructure fund, building schools for best-in-class operators to wanting to find more global, scalable, sustainable solutions to helping children pursue their objectives in education. And this is where Square Panda comes in four years ago, which is a platform that allows for very personalized teaching of literacy and teaching of second language English which is also important in America. It's also important in China as well as here in India. The earlier you can reach a child, the more you can impact them. So what are the subjects that interest you? I think that's as close to the bone as you get to understand why I care about education because I don't know. I just know I never had it, and I know what a crime that is for children not to learn what their passions are, to experience what they want for themselves. If I went to school if that was what I did, and I had a different childhood, I could explore what my life would be, but I don't know that. Do I love history? Yes, if the person telling me about history is interesting. Math is nice too because you like it when you can solve a problem and there's a real answer. You played with some great champions. Coming to the current era, are we witnessing the beginning of the end of a very special generation in men's tennis? In any sport when you can quantify improvement every 10 years you see improvement. Is the sport better? Yeah, unquestionably it's better. It's different. You don't see guys playing a lot like Edberg did, like Rafter used to play, like Pete played. I don't regret how the game has changed because I understand too intimately what it means to create that kind of change. I think it's a special generation. You have decades of history where only five guys win all four grand slams. And then three guys do it in three years. Murray will always be remembered for penetrating this generation of greatness and leaving his impression on it which is probably as remarkable an achievement as one can have. I think we're far from seeing Novak being done and I've stopped betting that I know anything about Roger because I've been wrong 50 times. Paul Anakin who coached Pete and Roger recently said one of the ingredients in the success of the greats today, other than the fact that they are gifted is that they don't have to adjust to different styles or surfaces. Would it be fair to say that you completed the career slam at a time when there was a greater disparity among the surfaces? I can definitely say that the grass has changed dramatically. But also the game has changed. The reason why it was so difficult for me to win on grass wasn't because it was so fast. I mean fast is okay, the first one to hit a good shot wins the point. Somebody has a good serve, it didn't matter if it was slow or fast. Pete aced me in Paris, just as many times as he aced me in New York or in Wimbledon. The problem was guys played coming forward so much they tore up the court through the middle. 
And so by the end of the tournament, I'm playing in the back of the court and every time the ball bounces, it's changing direction. The way they grow the grass today, it's more predictable. It isn't quite as fast. I can't say that my achievement was harder. Certain elements would be harder for me now too if I'm playing on grass against guys that can move as good as they move. I mean grass is physical. Fans gush at the accomplishments of Federer, Nadal and Djokovic. Three guys who are at the top of slam records. Do you think people tend to overlook this factor or are we just talking about really special guys who would have been dominant in any era? I had the privilege of playing all three of them. Novak was the worst of them because he was so young and it was an exhibition and he still beat me. Lover had two Grand Slams, 62. Nobody had come close to winning four in the same year. Federer could have done that three times with one match against one guy that he couldn't seem to be beat on clay. So you're talking about historic achievements. I get it when my generation left, Roddick comes in as an American wins a slam you know somebody comes in and wins a slam, but Federer, looks like who's this guy who was coming in at the right time and then he ends up having to compete against two of the greatest ever for the rest of his career and does it. See so yeah, I feel like these guys just kept raising the bar of tennis. So who do you think is the GOAT? We tend to define it in this day and age as numbers, but I can make arguments why numbers don't matter, you know. I mean Borg stopped at 26 after 11 Grand Slams, 6 French, 5 Wimbledons back to back for 5 years, almost won it the 6th year and he didn't play 10 Australian Opens when it was on grass. He played once. So, who knows if he didn't care about playing Australia. Lendl didn't play 3 French Opens because he wanted to win 1 Wimbledon. Numbers came in the early 90s when cable TV came. Everybody's fighting for news and Pete Sampras is going to break Roy Emerson's record. How many people know who is Roy Emerson? So does that mean Roy Emerson was the greatest of all time before Pete? Look at what these guys had to do. Fed beat me, Roddick, Hewitt, Moya. There were some guys that he beat to win the early slams but then he wins the other ones beating these other guys. Rafa comes in and has to beat Fed and Djokovic to win them. Djokovic comes in and has to beat both Fed and Rafa to win them. The highest standard of tennis I have ever seen is when Novak is playing his best tennis. It doesn't mean that he has maximized it, but he is not done. I think Fed has made more of his career than anybody. He's more versatile than anybody. Fed probably could have one Grand Slam serve and volleying only. Even when he was not allowed to come to the net, he could have still figured out a way to win. Nadal speaks for himself. Are you happy to see Novak back to his best? Do you regret the fact that you had an association with him, but it did not last long? No, I'm not regretful. I am very happy. The reason why I tried to help him or hope that I could help him, is because tennis deserves this. What he was capable of was never in question. He has his own tortured process, as we all do, and I truly believed that I could have helped him and I also believed that I could not help him. We process differently and as a coach there is a lot for me to learn. It's not what you know, it's what someone you are with learns. But somebody has to be willing to learn and willing to see things differently. So, part of his greatness is his stubbornness. I felt like I learned a lot and I felt like in some way I shook the cage enough that tennis could benefit. When the alliance with Novak ended, you said that you agreed to disagree on most things. If there is one thing that I will never change about anybody, it's what his body can do. What his body can do is never the problem. You don't go trying to fix the one thing that's remarkable. He was never healthy two days in a row with his elbow and I live by one clear philosophy which is if you don't listen to your body, your body is not going to listen to you. So we need to heal. But unlike me, when I played, he loves the game. He wants to play and he wants to run and he wants to find a way to get through the injury and playing injured is just not responsible. 
I can't support that because I'd be hurting the very person I'm claiming I care about. You get one body and you get one career and taking chances with this wasn't going to happen on my watch. Do you see him surpassing Federer's tally? I mean I am from Vegas, so I have to make a bet, right? If I have to make a bet, what is he at? 15, two more for three years. Yes. Now, you also have children, you also have priorities in life, so if he wants to, he will. You are coaching Grigor Dimitrov now. He's nicknamed Baby Fed for the similarity in playing styles with Federer. What's the issue with him? Does he get overwrought by big names or is it stage fright? It's a hard thing for anybody to be compared with Federer. There might have been a modeling of his game, but Fed plays with a lot of wrist, you know, Grigor hits through the strike zone a lot straighter. I believe that he has not seen his best tennis. He had some great results, but he's yet to feel what it's like to really build on a foundation that keeps taking him in the same direction and that has to do not just with tennis, but how you approach every day. He puts a lot of pressure on himself daily to be what he expects from himself. Do you feel players are more politically correct today? Does tennis lack characters? I think you guys scare the crap out of a lot of them. Laughs. Blame them, blame you, blame whoever you want, but I think being politically correct is not being politically correct. It's a pretty scary proposition in this day and age of social media. What played, what you said is what you said in its full context, but now you are guilty till proven innocent. On that note, the Colin Kaepernick issue snowballed into a massive controversy in the US and abroad. What did you make of it? Yeah, I don't know what his particular stance was. You called it a stance, or called it a kneel, I don't know. But in either case, if you want to offend half the people, you know choose one side or the other, but this is not something that I followed greatly. I mean I have a great respect for the American flag, so the connection I could never understand expressed in this way, but those that understand it would need to explain it to me. Do you think it would be if you and Pete were playing today, for all that went on between you guys, even if all is fine today? I don't know if social media would have changed me and Pete, because we were always good with each other. But I think the scrutiny now is tough. I just know that you need to be incredibly thoughtful these days, more so than in the past. In the past you got to be thoughtful, now you better be thoughtful. But are you surprised by how much warmth there is among the great rivals today? Yeah, I mean, surprised enough to not know if I should believe it, laughs. I mean, you know, I have the luxury of getting to know Novak and he would never be disrespectful to somebody you know, willingly or knowingly. You know Roger, it's impossible not to like this man. When you talk to him, his consideration to fans, to peers, to media. Same with Rafa, the time that they give, they are professionals all in their own way and I think there's a great deal of respect. You know with me it was different. Everybody knows my story. I was confused, I hated what I did. Sometimes Pete inspired me, sometimes I envied him, sometimes he annoyed me, sometimes I resented it. But I was the one that was makes up and down gesture. Then when you look back, you see Pete was just Pete. So, as a result, you got three great champions, four when you consider Pete, that didn't seem to have my problems. So I do respect it, assuming it's true, which you never know. Coming to your slam wins, which among the eight would you rate your most memorable? The last of the four, so the French Open, 1999. The first one I could have won, first one I should have won. The last one that I knew I would never have a chance to win again. So after I fell to 150 in the world, after I got a divorce, I was old enough to understand it. It was a microcosm of my life, that tournament. I was down two sets in the finals in, a lot like life. When you retired, BBC described you as, perhaps the biggest worldwide star in the sports history, what do you make of that tag? I was never trying to win a popularity contest laughs, but, you know, everybody comes to the game at this level bringing something. 
you don't become or you don't win multiple slams without doing something different than somebody else did it. My tennis game was the first thing that I brought different at a certain time and, certainly, my rebellion also did. I'm not sure the reason for it but I always felt very keenly connected to people. I was always honest with how I felt, so you knew if I was having a bad day, everybody knew it. You just said that Federer is a guy who is impossible to dislike. Just a few months back, we did come across a negative view expressed about the Swiss by French player Julian Benito who spoke of how Federer gets special treatment at slams. You know it is hard. It's hard to become Federer and then it's hard for other guys when you are Federer, you know what I mean. Federer didn't wake up overnight privileged. Federer was Benito at one point. So you eat what you kill. And then when you're on the top of the food chain, the jungle tends to listen to you. So everybody fights for the best circumstances daily, you know, from scheduling to what court. I mean I would play third round, fourth round in the US Open, Australian Open. I'd play some guy that was thrilled to win three matches on court 19 and then he comes into the stadium and I already know I'm up a set and a break before he figures out that this court is different than that court. The issue of on-court coaching triggered the huge controversy involving Serena Williams against Osaka in the US Open final. What are your views now as a coach on on-court coaching? I don't believe the sport should have coaching. I think it's one thing that separates our sport from so many. It's one thing that brings out the real gladiator part of it. I think, because coaching happens, the unfortunate part in Serena's case was the crowd didn't understand what had happened. If a coach gets caught coaching, it should be a warning to the coach. Second time it happens, the coach should be kicked out. Why a player should be penalized for a coach attempting to insert themselves. Equal prize money for both men and women has been a debatable subject for long. If you are paying someone based on the gender, there's no place for that. But if you are making a business decision about who you are trying to incentivize to be the content or the product you are trying to deliver, then it's your right as a business to decide whom you are going to value, what you are going to value. For all I know, more people watch Serena than Nadal but it's not for me to say whether they will or they won't. But if I ran a business, and somebody was going to come and watch Serena more than Nadal, I would pay Serena more than Nadal, because that's my business and vice versa. In your book, Open, you came clean about your drug offense. The revelations didn't go down well with the ATP and the ITF. How has testing evolved today? I understand the paranoia but let me be the first one to say I was the reason why this changed. It used to be internal governance that was legitimate as was mine when I was caught. We were able to leverage it on some level but once we outsourced governance, there's no turning back. It wouldn't be possible to cheat in tennis and get away with it. From 1998 on I probably averaged 20 plus drug tests a year. Three out of competition where they knock on your door even on vacation. Every 24 hours they get to know where you are going to be in the forthcoming 24 hours. So every day, they have an address and they don't care whether you are in the Maldives or at home and so it's not easy. But it's the right thing for the integrity of the sport.